So, and with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Gloria Chu. Um, she's very well versed in the field of keratoconus and scleral lenses. She received her doctorate of optometry at the University of California Berkeley School of Optometry and completed a residency in cornea contact lens at uh, the Southern California College of Optometry. She currently is an associate professor of clinical ophthalmology at the USC Roski Eye Institute Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. And most recently, she received the prestigious GP Practitioner of the Year by the Gas Permeable Lens Institute in January of 2023. So let's please welcome Dr. Gloria Chu. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Rob, for the introduction. I am going to share my screen here. Let me get it set up for us. And I think I need to swap this. Rob, can you see that? Looks good now. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. I am absolutely thrilled to be kicking off the scleral lens soiree so much that I even put on my pink party dress, even though you can only see my shoulders. Um, Thank you to all of you for waking up so early to join this celebration. And thank you to the Wu University and to the Scleral Lens Education Society for working so hard to put this program together. For those of you who know me, you might know that I pretty much live and breathe scleral lenses. We've seen the impact of these little pieces of plastic on our patients' lives. And I'm just so excited to be able to be speaking to you today on scleral lens management within the keratoconus spectrum. These are my financial disclosures and let's get right into it. So let's start with a keratoconus overview. As many of you already know, this is a corneal disorder with central thinning and bulging. It's bilateral, but often asymmetric. It's progressive, starts out hard to detect, mild, and, be, and can become very advanced. It's non-infectious, so it's not due to uh, infection, viral, bacterial, and it's non-inflammatory, or at least that's the definition. I had some very astute uh, optometrists question me after a talk once and said, well, you know, isn't allergic conjunctivitis and eczema and asthma related to keratoconus? And aren't those inflammatory responses? And I said, you know what? You're right. There are some um, uh, things that relate to inflammation, but our current definition is that it's non-inflammatory. But as we're learning more, the definition of keratoconus perhaps may change. The onset of keratoconus is in the teens around the time of puberty. And the prevalence and incidence really varies depending on the study you're looking at, the geography, the country you're from, and ethnicity. So for instance, there was a study published in the United States in 1986 that said the prevalence was 0.05% or one out of 2000. But more recently in Saudi Arabia in 2018, the prevalence was 4.79%. I feel like in the United States, it's perhaps somewhere between that now, we have better technology, better equipment and education to diagnose keratoconus earlier. In terms of risk factors, well, we know that younger individuals are more at risk for progression. Definitely, if you have a family history. So I have families in my clinic where the father and daughter have keratoconus or the mother and son and mother and daughter. So definitely don't forget to ask about family history, not only of glaucoma and macular degeneration, but also keratoconus. Eye rubbing is a huge thing. It's been reported in the literature that eye rubbing uh, releases inflammatory mediators that can lead to further progression and weakening of the cornea tissue. So these photos on the bottom, you can see the two eyes in the middle. This is actually from the same person. You see that keratoconus is asymmetric with severe scarring centrally on one eye and yet almost a clear cornea on the other. In advanced stages, you can see this severe ectasia with severe central thinning. And don't forget to flip the lids to look for signs of allergies. We have to understand that the cornea tissue in keratoconus is different. This is the, the cornea consists of connective tissue with cells and stromal extracellular matrix. 
that relies on this cooperation of many components together. This is needed to precisely transmit light so that we can see clearly. This extracellular matrix consists of these organized lamellae, these sheets of tightly distributed fibrils. These lamellae are altered and disrupted in keratoconus, and this is what leads to abnormalities in the shape. This is a progressive disease that's relative to defects in the stromal tissue. And as we know, the development is related to both environmental and genetic factors. So here's a compilation of photos from patients who I've seen over the past years. You can see in these pictures, there's corneas that almost look normal. They're clear centrally. Then as you move forward, you see Munson sign. As the patient's looking down, you see their eyelid protruding. Then you see these central linear marks. These are the corneal striae or stretch marks that I like to call it as the cornea bulges and the tissues losing its clear structure. You also see scarring in more advanced stages. And on the bottom right, you see scarring following corneal hydrops. Centrally, you see a patient in his 70s, just severe corneal scarring. And ultimately, you may even see patients who have had corneal transplantations because the scarring has become so severe. You know, but rather than just collecting photos and presenting them from mild to moderate stages and advanced, is there something we can do to catch it early and, and maybe prevent it from getting to the more advanced stages? Well, here are some tips for diagnosis of early keratoconus. Oftentimes your patients may be complaining of glare or shadows that are worse at night. We all have an autorefractor, right? So when you do your autorefractor and you see really erratic results with high sill, strange axes, very high, I mean like minus 15, minus seven, axis, you know, 55, asymmetric case. You can see this on your autorefractor as well as topography. Asymmetric case in one eye Say you have a flat or steep K, a difference of three diopters, or even between the eyes. Maybe one eye has an average K's of 44, but the other has average K's of 49. That's a little bit suspicious. What if you can't correct to a sharp 2020 vision? I've had patients who had their keratoconus misdiagnosed for years because they complained to their doctor that they would just notice these shadows and glare that it wasn't crisp, and they would refract to 2020. My patient was told that, you know, I think you're just a sharpener. We can't get your vision better. So if your patient says that, maybe run some corneal imaging. How about frequently changing prescriptions? If your patient comes to you every three to six months, I just, I can't see with these glasses anymore. Look at their eyelids, ask about allergies. Do they have papillae? Do they have floppy eyelids or family history of keratoconus? But ultimately the most helpful way to diagnose keratoconus in its earliest stages is with topography or tomography. And with that, we need to understand how to classify different stages. So there's different ways to classify. One of them is the Bellin ABCD staging and classification system. And this is based off results from the Pentacam. They use this criteria and can uh, categorize patients from stage zero to four. Essentially, you're looking at the anterior radius of curvature, posterior radius of curvature, the area of thinnest corneal pachymetry, and also your best corrected distance vision. So the Pentacam uses these different parameters, but even if you don't have a Pentacam, you can still be mindful of the steepening in the keratometry values, the corneal thickness, even if you have a handheld pachymeter, and of course, decreasing best corrected vision. Another way to classify keratoconus is using this amsler krumic staging. I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, but they categorize based off of four stages. And here they're looking at different things, not using imaging. They're looking at refractive um, data. They're looking at the degree of myopia and astigmatism as it progresses. They're looking at mean central K readings, which we can get from our uh, even autorefractors and to to topographers. And they're looking at signs through the slit lamp, characterized by Vogue's striae, whether they're scarring or not, and also corneal thickness and aberrometry data. So using some kind of staging may be helpful to you to help document progression over time. 
You can even use higher order aberrations as was published in this paper in 2020 by OVS, looking at where they evaluated anterior higher order aberrations from the placido disc based video keratography. So um, in corneal higher order aberrations, you may see coma and third order um, kind of deviations. And this may be useful in even keratoconus diagnosis and topographical classification. So many ways to help us judge the stages that our patients are going through. We also need to understand procedures that affect the cornea shape and vision in keratoconus. We're gonna talk about these all in a little bit more detail, but we have corneal cross-linking that halts or slows progression of keratoconus, corneal intacts that was FDA approved for keratoconus back in 2004 that essentially helps to kind of flatten and smooth out the surface. We have topography guided PRK that also smooths the cornea. It's not like normal PRK for a minus five myope. We're moving, we're removing very little corneal tissue in this procedure. We can't forget about cataract surgery and IOL selection. And then at the very, very last stage, perhaps corneal transplantation in the most severe cases, whether it's a full thick thickness or a lamellar keratoplasty. Now, it's also important to know that, you know, a lot of our keratoconus patients are scared and afraid that they may need to have a transplant. But I think it's important that we remind them that only a very small percentage of patients these days actually require transplant. A study that was published you know, over 10 years ago said that 12 to 20% may require it. But a more updated paper published in 2017 showed that the rate of penetrating keratoplasty for keratoconus has been decreasing in the United States, which is promising and, and, and good. So now that we understand classification, we can now recommend the best treatment for our patients depending on the stage that they're in. So this is a little kind of a flow sheet that I created. So in our early and mild keratoconus patients, we need to remember that we have treatment now to treat the disease itself. We have corneal cross-linking, which has been demonstrated to prevent further progression of the disease. In these mild stages for the vision, we have glasses, soft contacts, and maybe RGP contacts. So remember, we must not only manage the vision, but manage the disease itself. In mild cases, this is where you might consider corneal intacts or perhaps a combo with topography-guided PRK to minimize the need for specialty contacts. As we go into the moderate stages with scarring, patients are no longer candidates for intacts, but they might be candidates for specialty lenses, whether they're GPs, hybrids, or scleral lenses. And really, as you get into further scarring, distortion, and ectatic shapes, this is where you're gonna need specialty contact lenses and scleral lenses. Finally, once you get to the advanced stage with significant scars where you cannot correct them, where your patient is functional now in life with your best fitted contact lens, this is when you might send out for corneal transplantation. So let's go into the details of corneal cross-linking a little bit. So many of you may have heard of this, but I wanna make sure that you understand that there are FDA approved versions of cross-linking and those that are not. The FDA approved version came out in April of 2016, and this is using the KXL UV system using the specific Fotrexa and Fotrexa viscous drugs. Indications are for progressive keratoconus and post-refractive surgery ectasia. The procedure takes about an hour and the FDA version requires currently removal of the epithelium. For 30 minutes, you're using these drops, you're um, squeezing drops of the riboflavin. And at the 30 minute time, you need to make sure that you have a minimum corneal thickness of 400 microns. This is important because if the cornea is too thin, the UV and the procedure could potentially cause damage to the endothelium or the cornea tissue. So you need to make sure that you have a minimum intraoperative thickness of 400 microns. And if not, there is a drop, the Fotrexa, which is actually a, um, a solution that helps to swell the cornea. 
So it's kind of, I like to think of it as the opposite of Miro 128, which is a hypertonic solution that draws out the fluid. Fotrexa is a hypotonic solution that helps to swell the cornea. Once you have the proper thickness, then you expose the cornea to UVA light for another 30 minutes. There's no specific age range limitation for this procedure, although only patients from ages 14 to 65 were included in the study. So if you have a patient who's a good candidate, who's nine or 10 or 11 and progressing, you can still refer them for the procedure. And ultimately, it's this activated riboflavin and reactive oxygen species interacting to make the cornea stiffer to prevent further progression. So let's get into a case here. So we have a 24 year old Hispanic female. She presented to me late last year with blurry vision. She said, you know, doctor, I was diagnosed with keratoconus in 2018. My vision has been getting worse in the last year, but I was told initially that my keratoconus was mild and that it would go away in a few years. And I thought, oh my gosh, there was definitely some miscommunication going on because I don't think any optometrist would tell their patient that their keratoconus would go away. So we need to make sure that we're educating our patients appropriately. So when this patient came to see me, she had seen another doctor earlier that year, gotten new glasses, but only correctable to 2050. I saw her later in the year, re-refracted her. Thankfully, there wasn't too much of a change in her manifest refraction or best corrected vision, but she had never tried contact lenses and she needed corneal cross-linking. So I took extra time during my first visit with her to make sure she understood what keratoconus was, expectations moving forward, and what we could offer to not only improve her vision, but halt progression of the disease. We talked about eye rubbing, how you should not do that. We asked about history and the goal of cross-linking for her. So I ultimately referred her for cross-linking right away because we had seen progression from her prior doctor already. She was young, in her 20s, and these images are actually her pre-cross-linking images, and you can see clearly the red areas of ectasia and also central thinning using this global pachymetry data from the tomography. Also, you clearly see front and back surface elevation of the cornea, which is common to see in keratoconus patients. And sometimes you can even see posterior elevation changes before anterior elevation changes. So in this patient, October of 2022, um, I have the, the K values here as well as the K max, but I wanna draw your attention to after the cross-linking. So four months later, um, only two months after her cross-linking, you can see that her K max values have already decreased, went from 67.7 in the right eye to 66.2 and 71.2 in the left to 69.3. So you see here already a flattening effect after just a few months. So during my contact lens evaluation, as you know, I love scleral lenses. So I thought I have the best contact for you. We're gonna fit you in scleral lenses. It's gonna be the best thing ever. Unfortunately, I was unable to get these lenses in her eyes due to a very strong lid reflex. I needed anesthetic, which is very unusual. And it proved to be very, very challenging. I decided to go the RGP route. We were getting improved vision they were much easier to handle for her. So in addition um, to sending her for cross-linking after that first visit, we also discussed the best form of vision correction for her. Before I sent to my cornea specialist, I also reached out to her referring doctor to get notes. And this helps with the prior authorization process to get coverage for our patients. She had cross-linking about two months later. So sometimes it does take time. So keep that in mind. Unfortunately she wasn't compliant with her post cross-linking medications. She was given an antibiotic and a steroid and for some reason only used one of them and wasn't sure which one. So not surprisingly, she developed a complication of an infiltrate in her right eye. Once everything calmed down, her ocular surface was stable again, cross-linking had been done. I saw her back for her contact lens uh, fitting. And just recently, we finalized her fitting, and she is absolutely ecstatic with her vision, comfort, and fit with her RGP contacts. 
And just a reminder that prescriptions may change after cross-linking. So I refracted her um, after her cross-linking, compared that to before, and I saw a decrease in the amount of astigmatism. So something to keep in mind that refractions may change after the cross-linking due to changes in the shape as it's flattening. So a couple takeaway points here. We need to make sure we're educating our patients properly on keratoconus. We can't just monitor when they're mild and we can't tell our patient that it's going to go away. And we need to really consider cross-linking in our younger individuals, especially with family history of eye rub, uh, his, family history of keratoconus, eye rubbing, atopic conditions. Presentation is typically more aggressive in our younger individuals. So I love this paper that was published in 2019 in Ophthalmology that states that closer follow-up and a lower threshold for cross-linking should be adopted in patients less than 17 years old and with a steeper than 55 diopters of K-max. So we wanna make sure we're diagnosing, diagnosing and treating this condition early to avoid irreversible damage potentially in the later stages. And also know that as much as I love scleral lenses, you know, don't forget about our other contact lens options. So just to go over what it's like after the cross-linking, after the procedure, the patient is typically prescribed medications, including an antibiotic and a steroid, and sometimes a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Some don't like to prescribe that, including some of my colleagues, because it can delay wound healing lots of lubrication, and a placement of a soft bandage lens on the eye, so immediately after the surgery. So make sure to remind your patients you know, not to rub their eyes. You also wanna mention that there will be some degree of discomfort because their epithelium is being debrided and it may take some time for them to feel normal again. So let them know that that's normal. At week one, this is when we typically remove the soft bandage lens and the epithelium has healed. At month one, this is where we're going to reassess their vision. We're going to repeat imaging. We're going to look for stromal modeling that can often be seen, as you can see here, in these images from the anterior segment OCT. So the top is before cross-linking. The bottom is about two to three months after, and you see this line going through the midway of the cornea. This is a demarcation line, and it's been reported in the literature that this is a essentially uh, evidence that the procedure was effective. You see changes um, in the front part of the stroma and the untreated stroma behind the demarcation line. So this is just proof that something is happening in the cornea tissue. So at the one month mark, this is where you're gonna talk about contact lenses again for your patient. So if they were already wearing contact lenses, scleral lenses, RGPs, this is where they can rewear them as long as the epithelium is smooth. Now, if they've never worn contact lenses before and you have to do a new training, whether it's with RGPs or sclerals, there might be a little bit more trauma to the ocular surface. So you might even wait another month or a couple more weeks. And as I mentioned, the vision will change in the glasses over the first several months, the most in the first six months, but sometimes a little bit even through the first year. So you not, might not want them to get glasses immediately. You might ask them to use the glasses that they had prior to the cross-linking and maybe, you know, um, use that until you're getting more stable refraction. So be aware that the manifest refraction and best corrected vision can often change. And I have seen the vision sometimes get even better with glasses. And remember, if you do accept medical insurances, all of these visits when you're evaluating the health and state of the cornea can be billed to their medical insurances. With all procedures, there are potential complications and with cross-linking, it's not any different. There's possible infection, infiltrates, especially if the patients are not compliant, non-healing epithelium where you may have to come in and do the bandage lens again, or you might have to use some other therapies to help with the healing. Also corneal haze. And this is not haze like you see in traumatic scarring or following injury. It's this diffuse feathery haze that usually resolves over a few months. 
And it's not surprising because we do see a demarcation line. We know that stromal remodeling is happening. So this haze is actually showing you that, okay, something's happening in the tissue. In rare cases, you may end up with scarring that doesn't go away, but in my experience, it's pretty rare. And if you if your corneal thickness is not there, remember 400 microns, minimal thickness, you could have endothelial cell damage and possibly in the end, even continued progression. Now, some exciting news is that there are studies currently going on evaluating epi on versus epi off um, using new eye drops, supplemental oxygen, and higher energy and pulsed UV light. So in the future, we might even have an epi on FDA approved version of corneal cross-linking. So intax, this is the procedure was, that was FDA approved for keratoconus in 2004. It comes in different sizes in PMMA segments. They are inserted into the stroma to flatten the central cornea. And the best candidates are those with mild to moderate keratoconus with no scarring. And those who are contact lens intolerant who maybe just can't wear lenses and wanna see better without them. You need a minimum of 400 and 50 microns of corneal thickness, and the case should be less than 58. So this is, this is an example of a patient of mine. He's a 52-year-old Caucasian male, a businessman, after Intax, and this was his journey with me. Well, keratoconus more in the right eye than the left from his 20s that progressed in his, continued to progress in his 40s, so that's not typical but he had cross-linking performed in 2013 before it was FDA approved in the United States. And it was only done in his right eye. Similar history, dry eyes, ocular allergies that we may expect in our keratoconus patients. And he was fit with scleral lenses in early 2016. Now, this was a complicated fit because he was a sharpener, a type A perfectionist, and I needed um, glasses over his scleral lenses to optimize his vision. And not only that, he also had, he wanted the neural lens to help with his eye fatigue and comfort. I had tried a front torque scleral lens, but it didn't work because the amount of sill was very, very low. And as you know, that can drive you crazy as it shifts and is inconsistent every visit. He even had a complication with a stromal melt over his intacts in 2018, which took several, several months to resolve, but, but it finally did, and we didn't have to remove the segment. But this was a challenge. These are images of the patient's eye. You can see the top images, his right and left eye, and in the right eye, you see one intact segment going through inferior temporally. These are his corresponding uh, tomography maps. The left eye, you see kind of the typical keratoconus steepening, bulging, and thinning. But in the right eye, you can see with the imaging that the intax really creates this irregular surface. So maybe it's overall flatter and not as ectatic as it was to begin with, but you're dealing with a very irregular shape that can lead to higher order aberrations. And you have this plastic segment that can contribute to glare at night. And you can see on these images, you know, the, the intax segment going right through that stromal tissue. So this is what the patient saw without correction. He was about 2040 minus 2070. With glasses alone, 2030 plus. With scleral lenses and his contoured prism technology glasses over, he was 2030 minus in each eye. But let me tell you, he came in, oh, you know, it's just not good. It's, I still see clouding. And let me draw you where I'm seeing these shadows. He was very unimpressed. I eventually decided to collaborate with one of my local ODs to incorporate higher order aberration into his lens design because I just didn't know what to do anymore. I have aberrometers in my, in my clinic, but not the ones that are required to connect with labs that offer higher order uh, correction. So I'm happy to partner with my colleagues in, in the community who can help my patients when I can't. So I referred my patient to this other doctor who ended up making multiple iterations. He had to switch scleral lens designs, for some reason decided to add a multifocal, which I don't think worked great, ended up in a monovision design, um, and then glasses to balance over as needed. I reached out to this patient, 
uh, connected with him a couple months ago, and then he told me that his vision's changed, his distance vision was just wasn't sharp anymore, and the glasses weren't right. So I need to just prepare you for some of these challenging cases. Don't feel like you're a failure. It's challenging. Their eyes change. Complications occur. But you just got to work at it and let them know that you're here to partner with them. And it will take time. And lenses may change over the years. So this is what the base or alignment lens with markings looks like. So when you are trying to order lenses with higher order aberration correction, you first need to start out with an alignment lens where you take measurements with your aberrometer. You then send that information to the lab, which then creates a final scleral lens for you without all of the markings that has the aberration control built into the lens. So let's move on to another case here, also with Intax. Keratoconus and Fuchs. So this patient, oh, I've known him for so many years. He's a wonderful, pleasant patient. He presented to me with central scarring and haze already in each eye related to his Fuchs. He already had intacts. And I thought, oh my gosh, how can I fit a scleral lens in your eyes? You already have compromised tissue. You already have swelling. I'm worried that the hypoxia from lens wear can make this worse. So I was very upfront that this may or may not work. This was back in 2017. I made sure to measure his corneal thickness. I made sure to measure his eye pressures and follow him very closely. And remarkably over the last six plus years, I have not seen increased thickening despite his fuchs. His pressures have remained stable and his vision has remained at about 20, 30 in each eye, despite the central scarring and haze. He is as happy as can be. Um, and I think this is just an example to show that sometimes you think you can't do something, but just take it one step at a time. If you look in these images, you can really see clearly the endothelial changes happening in this tissue where you know, I was a little bit concerned in the beginning, but I actually saw him um, this month and he's doing great. Now, many of our patients that we fit with specialty contact lenses and have keratoconus tend to be young to begin with, right? In their teens, 20s, maybe 30s. But remember that as our patients age, they will need cataract surgery at some point in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. And IOL selection is very important in this group of patients. Multifocal IOLs in general not advised in patients with severe dry eye or keratoconus if they have scarring or thinning or a lot of distortion because contrast sensitivity is reduced. What about a toric IOL? Well, you're thinking, gosh, well, this is the perfect solution. I'm just going to put a toric IOL and correct this astigmatism. Well, it is not that easy, particularly in highly irregular cornea patients. This is irregular astigmatism. Now, if you have very a central cone, mild keratoconus, and the patient really hates their contacts and wants to be contact lens free, you might consider a toric IOL in some of the mild central cases. However, if they have distortion, scarring, a very ectatic cornea, and they're going to need their contacts again, do not do a toric IOL. Just do a monofocal because it's gonna drive you crazy. You're gonna have residual astigmatism that now you're gonna to have to try to correct in a front torque. Now with technology these days, better stabilization, better fitting, maybe that's okay. But um, in general still, I feel that we should avoid toric IOLs in some of our more moderate to advanced keratoconus patients because they'll need their contacts again. Um, and, and remember, not only in keratoconus, irregular corneas, dry eye, because scleral lenses will still be needed, we can fine tune the prescription in the lens itself. Now, before we send our patient for cataract surgery, we know that the ophthalmologist has to do imaging with biometry. We need to understand how our fitting with scleral lenses may impact corneal shape. This study published in 2015 looked at the influence of scleral lens wear on the corneal curvature and pachymetry in keratoconus patients. In 20 eyes of 14 patients, they found that directly after lens removal, um, after about a week, um, so directly after removal and about a week after removal, 
they actually noticed that curvature parameters were significantly flatter compared to when they stopped lens wear and remeasured uh, after a week. And that in K-Max, we were seeing almost a diopter of flattening and a little bit of thicker pachymetry. So although the scleral lenses don't actually mechanically touch the cornea, or they shouldn't, curvature and pachymetry seem to be influenced. In this other study, published in 2019, they looked at the effect of scleral lenses on topography in those who were cross-linked versus those who were not. Similarly, they found that short-term scleral lens wear in keratoconus patients may also cause flattening. So they found that the steep K on average flattened about a diopter and also the K max uh, decreased about a diopter. So this is interesting because it shows that cross-linking treatment doesn't necessarily guarantee corneal shape stability after scleral lens wear. So when we're sending our patients for imaging, um, I've, I've had this question a lot and a lot of disagreement from different specialists. Do you need to discontinue scleral lens wear prior to measurements for cataract surgery or other surgeries? Now for RGPs and hybrid lenses that contribute to corneal molding, the answer is yes. But for scleral lens wearers, it's kind of questionable still. And I would say maybe, because in your really, really dry eye patients, the scleral lens wear helps to optimize the surface so you can get better imaging. But in irregular cornea patients, in our keratoconus patients, are they going to be getting flatter K values because they wore their scleral lenses into the, the visit? Now, the effect is going to be more noticeable in patients who have higher K values to begin with. So I guess if they're already in their 60s or 65, a diopter may be might not matter as much as if it, their Ks are in the 40s and they're doing calculations. So this is something to think about and keep in mind as we're sending our patients for cataract calculations. Maybe they need to be out of their lenses still for maybe a day or two at least. Now before the surgery, the consensus is that you don't really have to be out of your scleral lenses, maybe a day to reduce the biofilm. So this question is gonna come up often. Your patients are gonna want to know after cataract surgery, when can I resume my contact lens wear, okay? Now, if they are wearing scleral lenses that don't touch the cornea and they are established wearers, they're trained and they have contacts already, my answer is between one to four weeks. Um, we know that these patients are reliant on their scleral lenses for best corrected vision, and it's hard for them to go and function well without them or maybe in their glasses. So if the epithelium has healed, you've removed the bandage lens and they have their contacts already, their scleral lenses and they're trained, go ahead and let them wear them, maybe, maybe two weeks after. You will likely need a scleral lens power adjustment. And what you can do is take their, their, uh, step, their habitual lens, put it on their eye when you see them back after a couple of weeks after their cataract surgery. I usually see my patients about a month after their cataract surgery. I've found that the fit of the scleral lens typically does not change, but I might need an adjustment in the prescription. So you can usually order the same design with an over a fraction. But sometimes the patient doesn't, you know, want to wait weeks for them to order the new lens. So, you know, they can wear their lens if it's more comfortable or if it's close to their prescription until their power is optimized. Now with New wearers, if they've never worn scleral lenses before and you have to train them, I'm not going to do it a week after, you know, you want to make sure that the cornea has healed, um, that the incision has healed, they're off some of their medications before you go in for a new application and removal training for scleral lenses. Ultimately, we want to avoid a cornea transplant for our patients. However, in advanced keratoconus, if the scarring is limiting their best corrected vision, this might not be possible. And remember, if we have to fit these patients with specialty lenses after a transplant, it is more difficult. Challenges include the time we have to wait, there's stitch removal, there's healing, and limited vision until we can fit a contact for our patients. There's corneal edema from, uh, from scleral lens wear, hypoxia that you have to be concerned about, which might lead to rejection or graft failure. 
And it's not like we're getting a perfectly smooth cornea after the transplant. We might still have an irregular shape and sometimes quite severe ectasia still. And now these patients are on chronic topical steroids, sometimes even for years, that now we have preservatives and we have to deal with putting drops in 15 minutes before you put your contact lens on, and they may have dry eye as well. So I believe more to come on this topic with Dr. Noyles and Dr. Williams in the post-surgical scleral lens rounds coming up tomorrow morning. Let's get to this case here. This is a 98-year-old Caucasian male patient of mine. Yes, my oldest patient. He has advanced keratoconus, which emerged as a young adult. He wore every single type of lens, RGPs, even fenestrated scleral lenses that he had fit in the 60s before I was born. And um, last year, he gifted these to me. He thought, you know what, Dr. Chu, I have these lenses. Would you be interested in having them at all? And I thought, oh my gosh, yes. Look at these lenses. Clearly scleral lenses uh, have been around for a long time. And these lenses here have little holes in them. They were fenestrated back in the 60s. So the idea was already around that these lenses might be more comfortable. However, I believe this material was PMMA probably because he said when he put them on, they just felt hot and his vision got cloudy. So they didn't work. Not until he was fit into scleral lenses in the 2000s. I fit him, I refit him in 2010. He has, he had very, very thin corneas, or I should say still has thin corneas. And the question uh, emerged, should we do a cornea transplant or not? Ultimately, we proceeded with the transplant in his left eye. Uh, about 13 years ago, the patient was in his 80s. Today, he is still in scleral lenses in both eyes. So I like to share this case because it shows outcomes in the same patient with advanced keratoconus with a transplant and without a transplant. So he is doing fine in his non-transplanted eye. He doesn't see quite as well, but he's also doing well with the scleral lens in his transplanted eye gets a little bit better vision. So let's go through some images. So this is in April of 2010. You see maybe a little bit of distortion, haze in the front, but no transplant. We decided to move forward and now you see scleral lenses on both eyes, but now he has a cornea transplant with a few sutures remaining in his left eye. You can see with this optic section, the right cornea is very, very, very thin. And this was the thicker of the two eyes. I believe the central thickness was maybe 150 microns. In his left eye, definitely more even thickness after the transplant. I again just saw this patient, I think last month. He is doing great. He puts his lenses on by himself every day, removes them. So if somebody comes to you and says, I'm too old for scleral lenses, remember that it's not the age, but it's the patient's motivation and ability to apply and remove the lenses. If they're motivated, if they wanna do it and they can do it, don't let age be a limitation. I once had an ophthalmologist tell a patient of mine, oh, you know what, you're in your 60s. I think you're too old to handle those lenses. And that made me really upset. And that made my patient upset because I subsequently fit him and he's still wearing them a decade later. Let's talk about this case for scleral lenses after transplant for another keratoconus patient. 60 year old Caucasian male referred for an evaluation 10 years ago. Now he had transplants in both eyes in the nineties and now his transplants are about 30 years old. He has similar chronic allergies, inflammation as many keratoconus patients do. Don't forget to treat the allergies. But we struggled with many, many different types of contacts. So he had already tried several versions before seeing me, but even when he came to see me, I struggled with fitting his scleral lenses. We dealt with fogging, midday fogging. We tried, we decided to switch to hybrid lenses, but because of the ectatic shape of his graft, we couldn't do that. We ended up back in scleral lenses and it took a long time to get into a lens that worked great for him. It ended up being a 17 millimeter torque design that was highly vaulted. He is very happy now we're getting minimal clouding. And this is just a really 
kind of a success case to show that even after transplants in some of the most severe cases, we can work at it, work with our labs, work with the consultants to get the best fit possible for our patients. These are images of the transplant. You can see how ectatic it is and how irregular the cornea shape is. And it's really just a, a great outcome. Here, you can see his corneas are crystal clear. You can see all the detail on his iris and you can see the edge of the scleral lenses here. And he's doing great. Um, I, I just saw him recently again. His grafts are 30 years old. He doesn't have rejection. He's, his eye pressure retina is stable and he's doing well. Now, this isn't always the case. I have patients who have had complications after their cornea transplant. Here's a patient of mine in his 50s. He had transplants very early on. I want to say about in his 20s before we had the degree of advanced specialty lenses and scleral lenses that we have today. He ended up developing secondary glaucoma in both eyes that required tube shunts. He ended up developing an infection in one eye. He developed strabismus and had uh, strabismus surgery. He's now monocular because he lost vision in one eye from the glaucoma. And because of his irregular scleral shape, we had to fit him in an RGP. Now, perhaps some of the corneal molding technologies would work well for him, but sometimes cost can be a barrier for some of our patients and don't forget about RGPs. Here's another patient of mine uh, who had a transplant very early on in life. He's only in his forties now, but he had his transplants, I wanna say in his twenties, again, led to secondary glaucoma. As you can see from these optic nerve uh, images, he has severe damage to his optic nerve in the right eye. He is about counting fingers in his right eye now, unfortunately, even though he has a perfectly clear graft, but thankfully he sees 2020 in his left eye with a scleral lens. So I was so happy and thrilled to see this paper published in Cornea two years ago in 2021. The impact of scleral contact lens use on the rate of corneal transplantation for keratoconus. The study concluded that physicians should maximize the use of scleral or RGP contacts because patients who successfully use these contacts have almost one fifth the risk of undergoing keratoplasty. So this is just a testament that we are doing a great job. We collectively fitting contacts have improved. We've gotten better. And we are now allowing our patients to live functional lives without having a cornea transplant. We know that scleral lenses for our keratoconus patients is life-changing, and this has been documented and reported in the literature, and it's continuing to increase. So there's a lot out there really just showing that uh, scleral lenses are valuable for our keratoconus patients and they've become better and better. We've improved quality of vision, quality of life, and they're a standard now in, in the management of this disease. We've seen so many significant design improvements over the years. I graduated from optometry school in 2008. I fit a total of zero scleral lenses during my schooling. It wasn't until I um, did my contact lens residency at SCCO, did I start to fit scleral lenses? And I, I'm just so happy to see where we are today compared to where we are when I completed my residency. We have capabilities in making corneal channel, sorry, corneal, scleral lens channels. This can be helpful in patients who have maybe tight fits, have some suction in the fit, have pinguecula, and just need a little bit of pressure release over that pinguecula. And even in cornea grafts, where you're worried about hypoxia and you just want to get a little bit a looser fit. So channels can work really great in those situations. You can do one, you can do two, three, four. We also have um, profilometry. So I was lucky to be able to acquire a profilometer in my clinic. Um, and I've been using it and I'm still learning how to work that into my clinic schedule and how I can best use it to optimize my fits. We have corneal molding technology. 
this blue goo that many of you may know about, you squeeze it onto the eye, get a mold, send that mold to your lab, and they can make a very customized um, shaped scleral lens for your patient. We also have scleral lens notches. So this is essentially a cutout where there's a divot made into the lens. And this may work for some of your patients with pinguecula. Now, although this is a possibility, I have sometimes struggled with these notches because if they're too big and become too close to the optic zone, you can sometimes get leakage of fluid or bubbles with lens wear. And the areas where you now have a notch, you have these two little rounded corners. And sometimes if they're not made correctly, they can dig into your patient's conjunctiva and cause discomfort and redness. So although this is an option, it's probably not my favorite option. What I like to use more for Pinguecula is something called scleral microvolts. Many different companies offer this. Work with your lab consultant. You can specify the width of the microvolt and the height and how deep you want it to go. And I have found this to be very, very helpful in patients with not only kind of flat elevated pinguecula, but also those with a more nodular uh, pinguecula. When initially I tried to play with the size, I tried to make it flatter in that area. If you go flatter, what happens is you get edge lift around the edge of the pinguecula. So a micro vault can work really, really well in these situations to contour um, bumps on the conjunctiva. And you can see in the lens that there's actually a divot. So it's not a cutout, but it's actually a bump, a divot. So here's another example, just working really well over pinguecula. Now, don't forget about scleral lens care and compliance. We know that it's more complicated than our soft lens wearers and even our rigid gas permeable uh, lens wearers. We must educate our patients that they need to use approved non-preserved saline for filling. They need to disinfect these lenses daily. Avoid certain cleaners that can be abrasive to the surface of the lens. I'm gonna go back one slide. This image here, this white film that formed near the optic zone junction of my patient was formed because he used a white milky cleaner that's a little bit abrasive and it left a residue on the lens. I told him to switch to another type of cleaner and after that, the film slowly started to go away. Never sleep in your lenses and make sure to come back to you for routine, routine evaluation. Patients sometimes will come in with chips and not even know it, have cracks in their lens, severely crazed ocular surfaces, and may not even know. It's your job to tell them their lens has been compromised and that they need a new one. Ask to see their cases and products. This, I, I almost, you know, I was like knocked out of my chair. This patient showed me his case. I almost threw up. There is debris and hairs and lint and... and how can you store your lenses in a case like this? Well, I threw it away. I gave him a new one and said, you know what? You need to clean your cases or just get new ones more frequently. On the flip side, I was ecstatic when my patient came in with this. She came in with her tray. She had, her, she had a hair tie. She had her solutions, cleaner, cases. That made me so happy. So just wanna review briefly filling solutions, make sure that you're using a non-preserved preserved solution. We have many FDA approved um, options these days. Do not fill with preserved saline, GP soaking solutions, multi-purpose solutions with preservatives. Please don't use peroxide. So you might see that happen once in a while, but a patient will never do that more than once because this will lead to surface toxicity. Also, I saw my first case of Claire with overnight scleral lens wear this year. A patient, his lenses were so comfortable. You have keratoconus, you can see the central scarring. He fell asleep with his lenses. He has a history of overwearing them. Woke up like this, freaked out, came in to see me. I said, look, you cannot sleep in them. We've discussed this. You need to take them out. I prescribed him a, a combo steroid antibiotic solution. He continued to improve and I don't think he'll ever do that again. 
So in summary, keratoconus is a progressive corneal disease that evolves through stages. We as optometrists must diagnose this condition early and offer treatment to halt progression. We must not forget that we're not only treating the vision, but also the disease, and that treatment ultimately depends on the severity of their disease and, and how they're classified. We have so many contact lens and scleral lens options available today to optimize vision. And yes, scleral lenses are awesome. Just remember that they may not always be necessary as in that case where I fit a patient success successfully with RGPs, but when utilized, we have advanced techniques to optimize fit and vision. And don't forget about contact lens care and compliance. Everyone, thanks so much 